All right, I'd call this meeting to order. Today is uh, Thursday, July the 8th, 2021, 10 a.m. agenda meeting. Uh, Mr. Lee, would you lead us in the pledge? And Mr. Thomas, with the prayer, please. Yes, sir. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Next item, Mr. Urban. Um, Boy Group Medical Insurance Renewal. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's that time of the year. Nice. <laughs> you don't hear me okay? Yes. Yes, sir. I think everyone has in front of them the uh, information regarding the renewal on the medical. <laughs> And just to kind of call your attention to that first column is the current benefits. And at the bottom is the premium, the current versus the renewal that's coming up. We had a 5.6% rate increase. I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but that is pretty much uh, I'd say in line, actually a little bit lower than we've had in the past. And the good thing about it is, based on the claims that we were looking at a few months ago, this is a very good renewal percentage. Um, our claims overall are running about 160% above premiums collected. So this is a very good renewal. Now, if we leave all the benefits as they are now, uh, we'll have the 5.6 percent kick in on 9-1. If the jury wants to entertain any changes, we have made one option available. Or there are many, many options available, but this one is the closest to the current benefits, and it does reduce the premiums somewhat. So if you look at that second column, option one, uh, it shows the premiums on an uh, employee-only basis as well as the employee spouse, employee children, and family. And so you do see a, a decrease there, and the overall decrease is a minus 3.6 percent, uh, or a reduction of about $7,600 in premium per month. Now, Katie, I think, has a breakdown of the effects of the pay period of employees and families as to the increase in premium. That um, do we have a breakdown on the on the option or just the renewal? For both, so the um, renewal, the employee would look at a ten dollar per month increase on average. And the police jury share would be $120 per employee per month on average. The, the option one that's on the table would reduce the employee share by $2 per month, and it would reduce the police jury share per employee by $85 per month. So in total, you're looking at either saving $7,600 per month parish-wide for all the employees for the premium, um, versus the renewal, you would increase your premium by $11,900 per month. Now the change, the recommended change, is pretty much passing off the premium increase onto the employees that are going to use the insurance. So that would change their co-pays from $30 to $40. It would change their deductible from $750 to $1,000 their family uh, deductible from $2,250 to 3000 
So that would be the main change. But everything else in their policy would stay the same. So your option is just accept the increase. It's only 5%. Um, you're looking at $11,000 a month for all 200 employees um, versus if you want to save $7,600 a month, then those employees would absorb the cost as they use insurance. Any employees that didn't use insurance wouldn't see any change. If they're not ever going to the doctor paying co-pays or deductibles, then they wouldn't see an increase in cost. It would just be as the employees use it. So that's really the two options. I'm not in favor of changing. I'm just. I think we should pass it on to them. Yeah. I think we just should. Taking it, that's like taking a while. For this year, anyway, just leave everything the same, in my opinion. And uh, let the costs go out. People don't like changes. You start talking about $40 and this and that. And I don't, I don't think we need, need to be doing that. Leave everything the same. And but this is, but this is for all the entities also. This yes. ain't just for this office. Correct. Whatever you, you accept passes on to your water district's employees, mosquito control, gravity drainage district. And that's just for your group insurance. So whenever you make a motion for its agenda item 18A, you could say, you know, you move to accept the renewal. Now, we are looking at changing companies altogether, dental, vision, and life. And that's mainly because it's supposed to be a more competitive rate. You would save money. The employee would save money. Um, this is more of a optional insurance for the employees. You only pay the dental for just the employee, and you pay the employee's life insurance. But everything else is elected by the by the employee, and they pay for it. What's the new company uh, we would switch to? Right now, we're with. You want to go ahead? Guardian. Uh, let me, I'll tell you what, before we jump to the uh, uh, dental, let me just finish up with the medical. Uh, if we're going to stay with the current benefits and just absorb the 5.6% rate increase, I think it's a good idea to, to, because at some point we are probably going to get a higher increase. So at that, at that time you can increase your deductible. Uh, I think right now with a 5.6, I would leave it like it is. That would be my recommendation. Also wanted to point out on the second page right behind uh, those rates are the companies that we did go out to quotes for. And we were declined, uh, except for the police jury association, they did send us rates on uh, their plan. But uh, you can see their premium is $1,141 per employee versus the $863 that we have with Blue Cross. So they're out of the ballpark. It's kind of hard to get somebody to give you a quote when we're using our you know, 50 times more, you know, mm -hmm. we're 1.5. It's not easy. We're losing money every year. Nobody wants to do business with you. We're losing money. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, too, is the, the, the uh, renewal history, which I think is very reasonable this year, 5.6%. If you've seen that page there, it's uh, very much in line with the years past. Um, and that was, of course, the claims experience. It's also in your packet. Uh, at this time, let me just say that we do not have a rate increase with the life insurance, which is with Unum, but we've got a better plan. Uh, the plan being a, uh, for the lack of my understanding of it, is a platform that we um, put all the pro uh, products on and the employees can select those plans from this platform on the computer or on their cell phone, which makes life a lot easier not only for for them, but for the staff, and we've actually visited the staff. Uh, we've had two meetings, one in our office in Lake Charles, one here locally, and uh, went through how the uh, platform works, and I think uh, especially Braze was very excited about it. Uh, but it makes life a lot easier for them and keeping track of all the information that's out there, and there is a lot of moving parts to this group in but in doing that, uh, we will uh, look at changing, we do recommend changing from UNUM, which is the life insurance uh, on the, that the police sheriff sure pays for and the volunteer, moving to another company, which will be on that platform. Uh, also, the dental and vision, we're looking at moving uh, to another company. 
And a number of reasons for moving the dental is because we're starting to hear some problems that some of the uh, people that are participating in that dental that are having with the dental. Uh, we're not going to be able to cure all the problems, but we're hope, hoping to make it a little bit easier to deal with, give them a, larger, a little bit larger network as far as the dentist is concerned, and at the same time reducing their premium. So it's kind of a, a benefit for them all the way around. Also, that will be on the platform as well. We're also looking at making some recommendations or some comparisons to the, uh, the plans that AFLAC offers and saving some premium and also updating the, the benefits on that side too. But that all will come from Christy Mundy, who is with me today, and she'll explain to you how all of that comes together. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. My name is Christy Mundy. I work for a company called GIS Benefits. Uh, we supply small brokerage firms like the one that Irvin works for in Lake Charles with the technology um, behind their benefits, right? So we come in and we offer three or four different enrollment platforms. The one that we're proposing for you guys today is called Benefits Connect. We offer Ease, Benefit Navigator, several different platforms. The premise of the platform is to take all of the paper applications that employees have been filling out for years and put that all online. So that if anything ever happens to the paper applications and they disappear, um, or in the case of a company in Lake Charles, they, it burns the ground and they lost everyone's applications, we have all of that information in a cloud-based environment. Um, we do this and we don't take any of the premium um, or any of the commissions that Irvin would receive or anyone would receive off of the benefit. We get paid an override by our select carriers. So we took your, um, what we call ancillary benefits, so your dental, vision, life insurance, um, and then we shopped some disability <coughs> policies as well. And we proposed that we put out a proposal to all of the different carriers that we work with that are select carriers, premier carriers. Um, and we asked them to bid on them. And then we took those bids and we um, spreadsheeted them out for you. That's what you saw in the break room with the donuts is the, um, all of them. What we're showing you today in the packet is just the ones that we would propose. So those carriers pay us an override um, so that they no longer have to handle um, the benefits administration. What our system says goes no matter what. So if they ever come back and argue and say, we didn't see that someone was enrolled a certain way, whatever, if our system shows a record of it, then that is the hard and fast law. Um, we're proposing this for a couple of different reasons. One of the biggest benefits to your staff is going to be consolidated billing. So it means that instead of Braids getting four and five different bills from a whole bunch of different carriers, she's going to get one bill from everybody beside the medical. And she's going to fill out that one bill and she's going to balance that one bill back to payroll and make sure everything matches up every month. So it's not her having to go through bill after bill after bill after bill. Um, when she terminates an employee or she hires an employee, she's going to automatically put that in the system. We're going to send all of that information via file feeds, via electronic file feeds, to the carriers. So there's no fill out the information here, go here and add it, here and add it, here and add it. It just consolidates all of that down into one specific place. Excuse me, place. So that being said, we did have to take the benefits out and shop them. Um, first, we started with your basic life, um, and we shopped that benefit. The best uh, um, bid that we got back was from a company called Equitable. Equitable is kind of a sister company to Blue Cross Blue Shield here in Louisiana, um, and they came back with a slight decrease in your rates that they proposed. So it's only like a 1.5% decrease to the current rates. We are matching plan design exactly. So if your employees get a certain amount of life insurance and your retirees get a certain amount of life insurance, we have matched that exactly the same so that no employee would see any change in the benefits that they're truly getting. Um, so equitable is who we would propose from a basic life perspective. We also took your dental benefits because we did have lots of conversations about some of the pain points that employees were seeing with the dental insurance and we shot that as well. Our proposed company is called Reliance Standard. Um, Reliance is a great, huge network in southwest Louisiana. Um, there are lots of different dental companies out there, but not everybody has dentists who participate in the network in our area. 
Um, Reliance has, we had Reliance go back and do a comparison between the Guardian benefits that you currently have and Reliance's benefits, and Reliance has more dental offices that participate in the network. Um, Reliance is also offering, a, um, you would see a slight decrease from current premium. So you guys pay for the base, what we call the basic plan for your employees, um, and Reliance is offering a 15% discount from where Guardian is on that exact same plan. Um, as well as on the buy-up plan that you offer for employees, if they want to buy a little bit richer benefit, they're offering a 10% discount on that, um, that richer benefit plan. So the nice thing is, is that your employees are going to switch, if they switch, they're going to have a bigger network, more dentist, and then they'll also have a decrease, a slight decrease in their premiums. Um, we also had uh, shop to the vision that came across flat, saying that they're matching rate for rate, as well as um, we had them propose to us some disability policies, some short-term disability and some long-term disability. Um, we understand that those are offered through AFLAC at this time, um, but w the benefits that we can provide on a group basis are going to be a little bit more rich than what um, you might be seeing through your AFLAC. So, any questions? So how long does that plan, I mean, that, that plan is ex extended through a, what, a period of a, just so, a year? Or? So it's an annual renewal, just like the medical is an annual renewal, this is an annual renewal. However, on the dental, they're providing us with a two-year rate guarantee. So no rate change for at least two years. Um, same thing on the basic life insurance, absolutely no rate change for at least two years. And then usually the rate change is capped at 6% per year for the next year or two after that. So we're not looking at seeing huge rate increases in the next couple of years. Good. And that pretty much the staff's recommendation. Uh, yes, um, it's going to provide, like you said, a, a larger network to the employees and at a cheaper cost. And it's also going to cut down accounting needs. Uh, it takes somewhere around three days a month for braids to do insurance payments. Reconciliations, and she'll be able to do that in about three hours. So that's more time she'll be able to dedicate to other duties. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. So when you get to the agenda item, if you're going to change those companies, then you're going to say you're going to make the motion to accept A as the renewal. We'll have to do it separately, and then B, C, and D will be to accept the, the proposed. Um, policy okay. change for reliance. Just standards. make sure we yeah, make sure, yeah, make sure we know. I got it written down. But we'll just you want to take it separately, Mary? Like yes. 18A, 18B, yeah. and I'll write it down for whoever needs to make the motion or wants to make it. All right. Uh, next, Mr. Kevin Sabo, Mr. Roman also. Good morning. Uh, we appreciate you giving us a few minutes on your agenda today. Uh, we're going to give you a short presentation of the grant that we are uh, administering. Louisiana Sea Grant is. This is Dr. Earl Malolfo with me today. Uh, Earl's kind of managing the grant. The grant is coming from CPR to wildlife and fisheries, and we are going to do the administration part of it. And part of that grant is uh, to establish a pilot alternative oyster culture project. And Galveston Lake and Cameron has been identified as that project. The reason we were identified as that is because we're somewhat isolated from the big Mississippi River Delta and all their issues that they're dealing with. The other reason is about four years ago we established what was called, we call ourselves an oyster resource group. It was Louisiana Sea Grant, the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, Nature Conservancy, and Cameron Port. We partnered together and we started meeting and looking at all the issues in Calcasieu Lake dealing with oysters. Uh, stock assessments, where uh, coast plants were going to be placed, where good locations were going to be, uh, when the harvest dates were going to be ready for those different coast plants as they came into market size. Uh, so we looked at a lot of different things. And one thing we always discussed was alternative oyster culture, which is growing oysters uh, produced in a hatchery in cages. They hang on long lines or they're uh, tied together and sit on the bottom. So we're looking at setting up a pilot project like that in Cameron. And we met with the port 
uh, last week or week before, and uh, Mr. Butch Gidry was there and asked us if we would come to the police jury meeting and sort of give you guys a, a, an overview of what we're planning to do. Um, but we're hoping that the port will agree to be our local sponsor uh, for this project, because we need a local partner. Someone's got a whole water bottom lease for that area, uh, and then they'll have to give leases to individuals who want to come in and get, you know, a one to one and a half, maybe two acre square in there uh, to operate, hang cages. And another part of and this grant is going to pay for all that. It'll pay for the legal work to do the, uh, get the state water bottom lease, It'll pay for coastal use permitting and the parish has offered to help us in working through that process as well. Uh, but hopefully we're going to stimulate some, Who's some business. Who will who manage that? Who? Manage the, the pork when it's set up? Well, the pork's going to uh, be in charge of the leases. Yeah, leases. yeah they're going to yes. hold the lease. Yes. Now, they're going to hold the lease from the state, and they will issue leases to individuals that apply. Now, okay. Ross, uh, this question about the, whoever applies can... Uh, Harvest those two acres. Yeah. Okay. How is that going to work? You make sure to try to help the locals out first before. Yeah. Um, I mean, there there are a lot of different uh, criteria for who can qualify, and some of the things are. And Errol, correct me if I'm wrong. You got to hold a commercial fishing license. They look at your history of what you've done in in your career. Um, there are a lot of things, but yeah, local folks can definitely apply for this, and we hope that's what happens. That's, that's the entire reason why we're doing this. Yeah. Yes. And, and I, I, initially, we don't see this as uh, someone just changing everything they do, and this is going to be their living. This is going to be sort of in addition to what they're already doing, and maybe an additional source of income. The, these oysters that are producing cages are for half shell market. They're a premium product. They're a high-priced product. Uh, they're not going to compete with what's out there on our reef. There's just too much volume out there. Uh, we, we can't compete with that. But if you can get more money, uh, and you can get them up, in Grand Isle they're growing them from little seed oysters the size of a nickel to a market size in about eight months. Wow. They grow what, really fast, the, suspended up in that water column where all that algae is. What's going to be the cost, the initial cost? To I think I can answer some of that. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Earl. He's going to talk a little bit about the grant. It, it's, I, a, it's an extensive it. process, and we're just starting. So we kind of want to announce it, and I also want to uh, announce to anybody that's here, we're holding a meeting at 1.30 over at the port office, sort of an informational type meeting. People ask questions or if anybody's interested. But we're, this is just the beginning of this thing. It's going to be quite a while before we get through all the land lease issues and the coastal use permitting and Wildlife and Fisheries has actually got to take this, whatever area we identify, he's got to, they've got to take that water bottom area out of the public seed ground so that it's available to lease. It is a small area compared to what's out there. Yeah, if, I've got about eight slides to show you if I may. And, and let me just, I, I think the important word as you see at the top of there, the possibility of this happening. There's a lot that has to go into this process and, and, and we're here, Sea Grant is here to help Wildlife and Fisheries and, and in this case, Cameron, uh, to look at those possibilities. We're, we're like kind of the facilitators to help in that process. Uh, let me tell you that when Sea Grant, Louisiana Sea Grant became involved with this, when Wildlife and Fisheries came to us, we wanted to make sure that we would not be involved with anything that could harm or change the traditional oyster industry whether it be on the east side of the river where it's but dredging and tonging and by hand or whether it's over here by just tonging. It's got to be something that does not have any interference with the traditional oyster industry. It's kind of like increasing the diversity within the industry for someone who would like to do this. And that's what this does. And this type of diversity to increase the industry is not new. It's something relatively new in Louisiana, but it's been around for decades on the East Coast and the West Coast and in uh, Florida for several decades as well. And I've just got a few slides to show you. Uh, let me first of all also tell you that when Kevin talks about leasing, 
that sometimes can be quite controversial, particularly when you're dealing with Calcasieu Lake, which is a public body and there are no leases in it. What we're talking about is equivalent to what you might want to call an industrial park, but it's on the, it's, it's a water bottom. And we're calling it a park, and its footprint is probably going to be no more than about 25 acres. And we're already beginning to look with wildlife and fisheries at sites to come back to the public and say, this is where we think it should be, and do it where we're not interfering with the public reefs that are already out there. Uh, okay, so if you'll look at this, oh, let me back up. Maybe I can't back up, but that's all right. We don't need to back up. I can back up. No. No. Don't worry about it. I can do it. I've got it in my head. I know what I gotta do. I want you to know I'm from Bayou Lafouche, and I'm just bringing the problems over here with me. <laughs> okay, let's go one slide and see what happens. <laughs> it just it, it just jumps. All right. Yeah, that's the, that's the important slide, I think, for you to see right here. You know, we talk about off-bottom culture. you got to know what we're talking about, so here are some slides. These three slides show you what's typical in the northern Gulf of Mexico. The bottom slide is what's most typical here in Louisiana. Those are floating cages. Those quay cages might be two foot wide and, and, and three foot long, and they have floats on them. And, and depending on the size of the oyster, you could have 100 oysters in there, you could have, you could have 100,000 oysters in there, depending on the size. They just move them to cage to cage as they grow. And those are floating cages, they are anchored. I'll show you an anchoring system in just a moment. That's the typical type of floating cages you see in the only park we have in Louisiana right now, and that's a Grand Isle. And it's, it's managed by the Grand Isle Port Commission. So, we're looking at working with the Port and Harbor District here to do something similar that's already being done in Grand Isle. So we have someone who's already done to, to a lot of this hurdle, and, and we'll use them as our partner in trying to help here for those possibilities. If you look at the top left, uh, there are a couple of fishermen that are using bottom cages, much heavier cages that are on bottom, but it's a very hard, solid bottom with good current so they don't get covered in mud. And they just use a, a, a buoy, a float on top to, to bail a margin. And those big cages like that, out of that boat, you have to use a winch to pick them up. These other cages, you can flip them by hand and you can move them around by hand. So just a small boat will do. So what we're looking at doing is saying, is there a possibility at Calcutchew Lake to develop one of these aquaculture parks, what we call it alternative oyster culture, and, and everywhere else in the country, in the world, if you say off-bottom oyster culture, people know what you're talking about. But here, we're using the word alternative oyster culture because we have such a rich, traditional <coughs> oyster industry, and we want the people to understand we're not trying to replace the traditional oyster industry. We're trying to increase diversity. Uh, and uh, this is a statewide project. And we are trying to establish by the end of three years, if not established, at least have the process really far along to have three parks in Louisiana. We already have one at Grand Isle. And they're eligible for some of this funding now because we don't want to leave them out. The second park we're trying to develop is right here. And the third park, we're not even going to try to go to other people and ask for a third park because we'll see how far along we can get with, with, with Cameron. But we're looking at a third park, and it could be anywhere else in the, on the coast. Most likely, it would either be in St. Bernard or Terrebonne Parish. We're looking at one of those two areas. But what we have is thank you. Uh, this you can move back to that slide. That's just telling you that there's other others in the state. Uh, that's just showing the goal and, and how we're going to do it. Kevin's already covered that. You can move to the next slide. Uh, here's where the money comes in. We have a little over $2 million in this program. 
Louisiana Sea Grant is going to keep $217,000 of that money to do outreach. And by outreach is where we have our legal team. We have, we have attorneys on staff at Sea Grant who would be working on this project uh, with your people and your lawyers to make sure everything is done in a very contractual and upfront way. Uh, we would have the ability to work with fishermen to give them the ability to show how to do this, help them with business plan development, help them with how you develop for marketing, because this is a specialty oyster. Uh, but the vast majority of the money is at the top in $1.8 million, and you see four bullets right there, parks, private hatcheries, grow out farms, and nurseries. There's $100,000 per park. So we're coming to you saying that right now, if, and, and the port has already said they would like to explore this possibility. So we're going to have made available $100,000 to the port and to the police jury as part of this too, to, uh, to explore these options. But the $100,000 is not just for coastal use permit or things like that. It's also to help if we get a port, you got to have your lighting system, your navigation lights, you got to have your buoys out there, you got to do everything Coast Guard wants and the state wants and the Bureau of Land Management wants. So we have the $100,000 there for that. But then you get a park. Where well, there's a park if you don't have people in it? So we're going to put, if you look at hatch nurseries and grow outs, we're going to have uh, a number of grants available for nurseries and also for grow outs. And I think for here in, in Cameron, the vast majority of people are going to be interested in the grow out form, where you take the little small oyster you get from an hatchery put it in a cage, and then you transfer from cage to cage to get it to size for the market. And uh, for the grow-outs, we're going to have about, we're going to have $45,000 per grant available. We know that to set up a park, <coughs> about a one-acre farm, will take about thirty-five dollars to $40,000. So we've actually put $45,000 into that so they can buy their cages, they can buy their seed for the first time, they can buy all the gloves and hatchets or whatever they need. We're not allowing them to buy boats. We're not allowing them to buy motors. You can't buy a truck. Yeah. And there's no salary. It's for people who are going to put some of their own skin in the game. But we're saying this is a high risk business, like every fishery project is. Every fishery is high risk. And this can be high, high risk. So we've got $45,000 available for you. For nurseries, we're doing $15,000. So, What's interesting too, and what's important is that basically we put 45,000 and we're telling farmers, you can take 5,000 of that to go out to your coastal use permit and your bonding that you might need, but that would not happen in Cameron. In Cameron, the coastal use permit would be with the park. And then everyone who is in that park is grandfathered in and they don't have to go out and get their own coastal use permit. So that means that's an extra 5,000. So, you know, this is a statewide project. So what we did is say, if I've got X amount, and we're actually putting half the money in grow-out forms, so that's $900,000. I've got to take that $900,000 and, and be equitable across the state. Because there's a lot of leaseholders. On the east side of the river, you can have, on, the, on the east side of the state, you can have private leases. And we do have two individuals, the one in that boat that I showed you with that big heavy cage in the first slide, He's actually doing that as a, on his own private lease. So you don't have to be in a park. So what we did is take a third of that $900,000, though, and reserve it for just you applications that might want to be in the park. So that means when we develop a park in Cameron, we're going to have roughly about $300,000 to fool with, not only in Cameron, but for the Grand Isle Park as well, and for what that third park is. But your farmers in, in here are going to have to compete for that money. It's not, it's not oh, look, we're just going to give you $45,000. Uh, there is an application form. And uh, one thing that was brought up at the Port Commission, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, so you don't have to try to cook it in the in in meeting this time. Uh, I talked a lot last. I'll just say the last. That did not happen. No, I was there. <laughs> You're not looking at one. 
No, what would she did not what we tell you about beating on people? She did not hit with a needle. She was sitting next to her. She said, I sure wish you would be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, they're going to have to compete. But one thing that was said at the Fourth Commission was, you know, most of these farmers, or most of these fishermen are just fishermen. They're not business people. And we understand. And we're making the application as simple as we can. We're doing all the legwork. We're trying to make it also where we're going to help with the business plan. We're going to help them develop. We're showing them how to do it. But we're also saying, partner with someone. You might have a restaurateur in the area. We have people who are interested in this, but are not fishermen. Join them and maybe do it as a partnership. Will this succeed? We don't know, but we're going to try to make it happen. So we just want to break. I'm not going to show you any more slides so I can be quiet now. But uh, uh, the, the reality is, we think it's a good program. We'll see if Grant wouldn't have gotten involved in it. Uh, let me say that Claire Morso with the Port Commission has been part of this program and trying to get something developed with the oyster industry for a number of years. So when this program came up, came up, uh, we thought that Cameron was certainly the ideal place to start with it. And uh, that, that's all I have to say. Any questions? Scott, anybody have any questions? I got a couple of quick yeah. questions. Uh, you probably went over this in your meetings already, but just for the sake of the public to have it. Uh, is there going to be any restrictions, any harm to the local archer people by doing this? No, sir. Uh, okay. These are very specialty oysters. They're going to be either, the only way you can make a decent profit with this because there's labor involved with all these, and, and money involved with getting these cages. I mean, to do a, a place like this, you need about $20,000 worth of cages. So, uh, but the oyster is a specialty oyster for the half shell trade, and it's, it does not interfere with the traditional oyster industry. We went to the Louisiana Oyster Task Force with this project, and I would not be standing here if I had not gotten their approval to move forward with this. Okay. We gave them the whole, the whole spill for an hour and a half doing this. Okay. Uh, and uh, will there be navigational beacons out there? Uh, that's part children? of the park. That, that's going to become part of the park responsibility and eventually the port's responsibility, but we're going to begin, we'll do the process initially with that $100,000 to make sure it's out there. Well, if it's new and if people travel that at night sometimes, it would be easy to run over those. Uh, and, and, and that's going to be part of our, our strategy of trying to find a decent location that's not only on top of productive reefs, but also where uh, not in the hottest fishing spot. No, no and, and we know that too. Yeah. Well, we know that too. But also let me tell you that if you go to Grand Isle, the highest spots for fishing are around these structures. Right around around here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's good, good fishing around these structures. Okay. Just a couple more quick questions. Who, who would police this? Would this be state uh, a lot of fisheries? Who would police it? Who would kind of oversee? No, that's going to be the responsibility of whoever is administering the park, just like Grand Isle does theirs. So that would be the port board? It, and, it, and it winds up being the, the fellas out there with the farms. They protect each other. Okay. Is there vandalism? Absolutely. That's life on the water. But uh, they protect each other. That's one beauty about having it as a farm so that you have, uh, I mean, a park, you have up, maybe up to 10 farms in, could have up to 10 farms in the system. So somebody's out there all the time okay. looking at it. But, that's a reality. Last question. Uh, will these archers be marketed in Cameron? And what is in, in this for Cameron Parish? And because I know on the east side of the state, it's kind of a syndicated deal where these archer fishermen are really in com competition and, and, and people holding a bunch of leases and what have you. And I'm assuming this is different, but it's the first step towards that same type of syndication. I'm wondering if, if we're going to be getting into that and taking away anything from the local? We don't see that, and but we're we're very aware of what happens on the east side of the river, I mean, on the east side of the state. Uh, and uh, I, I can tell you that right now, if we take a look at the farms in Grand Isle, uh, some of these guys have been in business, the longest have been in business for maybe eight years. And most of these guys are just like the way the crawfish industry was at one time. They're out there marketing their own oysters to their own restaurants, or to their own individual households. Uh, 
That's not how you grow a business over time. I mean, that's good for the mom and pop operation. And I would say that when we see this developing here, uh, chances are that each one of these farmers with their own lease of one or two acres would probably be establishing their own connections. Uh, what we would hope is that eventually, if they could become some type of cooperative work with a distributor so that you can move this stuff out. But the oysters are going to be here. It's up to the farmer how he wants to do it. It's just like your oystermen here. Who they sell to is, is their business. Okay. Uh, and, and, and we go. That's all I got. So where would you get your seed, seed oysters from? Well, from a hatchery. Right now we have a, we have a Grand Isle hatchery that's run by Wildlife and Fisheries and Louisiana Sea Grant through LSU. Uh, it's, a, it's a research hatchery, but it's also being used for commercial production. You can buy your seed there. Uh, but we also have a private hatchery in Louisiana that's uh, uh, actually land-based using recirculating seawater. And they've become quite successful this year. They were struggling last year. They've been in business three, three years, but this year they're, they're really humming. And they're selling a lot. But you can also buy seed uh, from other states. Uh, now, that brings up an important question. I'm glad you brought that up. We're working with wildlife and fisheries to make sure, Calcasieu is very isolated compared to the east side of the state, where oysters are moved from one location to other, from, from the Biloxi Marsh near Mississippi all the way to the Atchafalaya. You see oysters being mixed all over. <laughs> but you don't see that when you come over here to Calcasieu. It's a very isolated body of water. So part of our process is to make sure that the oysters that are going to be spawned in the hatchery will be Calcasieu oysters. We're not going to be bringing in genetics from other lakes. So right now, LSU Sea Grant, uh, Louisiana Sea Grant, uh, has made the commitment that uh, we're going to use our hatchery for any type of oysters that we'll take from here and spawn and put in the hatchery and raise them up to a seed size of larvae to bring them back over here. Uh, the private hatchery in Louisiana has already said the same thing. And then if any private hatchery outside of the state would want to use with calculus you, uh, right now, Wildlife and Fisheries and Louisiana Sea Grant supports this, that uh, it would have to be original adult from calculus Good. Anybody? We should appreciate it. We'll I thank, thank you for giving us the opportunity to just share with you what we're trying to do. We appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. This is, this is really just a, uh, well, a totally different market. The oysters have a different look to them. And they never touch bottom. They're never in the mud. Uh, and a lot of times when they're produced in a hatchery, they got a black stripe on them. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. not sure exactly why that happens, but it happens. Well, I, I can tell you that these oysters have a quite unique look to them. And, and, and if, if somebody would steal oysters out of one of those cages and try to sell them as an oyster off a reef, yeah. Couldn't, do Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Okay. Thank you all. We appreciate it. Okay. Miss Katie Boyce. <coughs> Katie, hey, Katie. <coughs> when do you need to stop beating on me? <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. How are y'all doing? Good. 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 Fine. Thank you. Good. Um, sorry, I missed last month's meeting. I had a flat tire. <coughs> so. I wasn't able to get here from last yet. Um, yeah, so good morning. I just wanted to give y'all, I'll be very brief. I just wanted to give a brief update on the nesting <coughs> activity on our beaches. And I wanted to first start off by saying thank you to the community and all of the folks that have been involved with helping us protect the birds, and especially the local enforcement and their presence, we really appreciate their presence in working with LDWF Wildlife Enforcement to protect these sensitive areas on our beaches. Uh, our birds this year are doing really well, and um, I wanted to give an update on the 4th of July. There were some great uh, festivities going on on both holidays <coughs> and the beaches, but everybody um, was being very respectful of the fencing. They came up and asked questions. We did a lot of uh, outreach. We had lots of volunteers. And I wanted to give one shout out to Claire Marceau, who showed up with water and ice for our team uh, at Rutherford Beach. So appreciate that so much. And um, 
yeah, local enforcement and LWF have been working really well together and helping us keep those areas safe for not only us, but for the birds as well. And um, lastly, I wanted to say that uh, for, uh, the 4th of July was a huge success in terms of just minimal disturbances or incidents where there was any kind of vandalism or anybody actually driving through nesting areas. So I really, really like seeing that. And um, on the east side of Rutherford, where you know lots of folks come to enjoy the beach for the Memor uh, Memorial Day and Fourth of July weekends, um, we didn't have any incidents of people going into those fenced areas. So it was really, really great to see everybody um, respecting those signs and working together to protect what we all love out there, which is our, our wildlife and uh, our coastal habitats that protect us. So thank you so much. And I will be out here, um, probably be out here in August as well. We have our technicians still until the end of this month. So they'll be out, Adrian and Shannon are out monitoring these sites and they protect areas from Rockefeller to Holly Beach. Thank you. All right, Katie, thanks for updating. Thank <coughs> All right, number six with Stephanie Stutes. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Stephanie Stutes. Uh, my husband and I are owner and operator of GNS Snow Cones. Um, we live in Grand Lake. Um, our business is operated <coughs> on Common Street right now. And we have some customers that have expressed the desire to be closer to the Grand Lake area. They drive to come and purchase from us. So um, I'm here today to ask for permission that we be able to work our snow cone trailer in the Grand Lake area. Right now, right now, it's, all, it's, all, it's kind of wide open right now. Um, it's been open. Well, let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. Is it strictly snow cone? Uh, we have ballpark food also, nachos, Frito pies, and hot dogs. My only concern is that uh, this would be a food truck, right? Pretty much. It's not a snow cone truck. Well, it's basically more snow cones than anything else. Yeah, I understand that, but I have a problem with issuing permits in the Grand Lake area it's going to be counterproductive to our local business. And, uh, you know, the people that set up stores in delis and whatever, mm -hmm. they take a risk. You know, they put out a bunch of money, and, and the last thing they need is competition driving in. And where does this, and where would it stop? So we allow you, but where would it stop for the next? truck or trailer or vehicle because it wouldn't be fair to allow you to do it and not allow anybody else to come in and do it. That's my only hesitant. Of, uh, I understand we got Gaddies that comes and they, they do a thing with the school and it's been going on and it's not ever been a conflict with our local businesses. So that's my only concerned about it. I think if it was just a snow cone machine, I mean snow cone, wouldn't it be okay if they snow cones and no <clears throat> good trucks? Um, It'd be up to y'all too, could, I guess. Be to, I think the ordinance written a little bit different. I mean, snow he has cone. to get a permit. Yeah, because it's a food truck, they'd yeah. have to get a permit. Right, yeah. but if it was just, if it was just, just strictly snow, snow cones, just no cones. Right. that's they there for riding up. So you get into an area if you're going to allow snow cones and, and hot dogs and yeah, nachos, in, yeah. then you turn it into a food truck. So the next person that comes in and says, oh, by the way, I'm going to have snow cones, but I'm also going to be serving hamburgers and fried chicken and everything else. That's the problem I have with issuing a permit for that type of, of operation. Because um, I'm totally, I stated it this way, I'm totally against food trucks in the Grand Lake area. Totally against it. Yes, sir. What if we were to agree to sell only our snow cones in Grand Lake? That may, that would maybe work. If it would, would be limited to snow cones. And that has nothing to do with our permit, permit whatsoever. It, it's 
Snow cones are allowed no matter what, right, Moss? Where's Robin? I'm going to refer to Robin. I think. Yeah, that we just have to make sure DHH can accept right. that it's I mean, we can get a permit, but that doesn't say you can begin business because you got to go through DHH, and he can shut you down or he can let you go. Right. right. We have an unlock. Do we, we do allow snow cones, right? Yes. In our ordinance, yes. In the ordinance. In the ordinance in already. The ordinance. Mm -hmm. yeah. So okay. if it was limited cone just to snow cones, I think. She's being. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you could do it. You could do it. So it's when you, it's when you start selling other things right. that's going to compete with restaurants and other stuff that's there. So that's, do we need to come through the Department of Health for Cameron Parish yes. mm -hmm. to do the grant lease? You need to get with our permitting people and find out exactly what's available and what's going to need to be approved by the jury. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate yep. it. You're welcome. Okay, Ms. Katie Omator, PPDR Dick. Yes, so private property, private property debris removal and other right of way debris removal. So we've concluded our right of way debris removal program, and right now, best case scenario, we're looking at a cost share of around $915,000. Now we did receive 250,000 from the state of Louisiana um, for disaster recovery that we are gonna allocate to that. So right now, best case scenario, you're looking at out of the general fund, your cost share for just standard debris removal from the rights of way, $665,000. <clears> I say best case scenario because that's assuming that everything all is eligible. Sometimes FEMA, when you start submitting invoices and they start looking at things, they may deem certain things ineligible. So right now, best case scenario is going to be 665. We won't know if that cost is going to increase until after FEMA approves the PW. We've submitted everything to, PW, to FEMA. We haven't received the obligation yet. They're still reviewing the scope of work, but we hope to have that in another 30 days. So that's where you are, but just debris removal. So. Now, as we talk about private property debris removal, which is just um, demo and houses that are left on property, uh, removing large debris that is outside of, of that 15-foot right-of-way. Um, we had the applications open. Um, as of earlier this week, we had 114 applications, and that varies between house demo and, like I said, large collection. The budget right now, based off of our, our monitoring firm, they're thinking that it's going to be about $13,000 per property, is what they're estimating. Um, based off the applications, if we had 114, even if we say we wanted to do a budget of um, 150 properties at $13,000 a property, you're looking at about a $2.5 million program. Now, the call share would still be 90-10, so we would be responsible for the 10%, but we're already out of pocket 665, so. Um, it's just something that it's time to make a decision. Do we want to pursue this program? If we do, it's time for us to go ahead and get a, authority to advertise, to get a contractor in. And, and that 13000 per property is just the estimate. When we bid it out, it could be reduced. It could be greater. But we need to make a decision today, or if you want to table it, push it back a month and see. Um, it's up to you guys, but it's time to, to either pull the trigger, or allocate the funds, knowing that you might have to commit up to two and a half million dollars up front before you get your FEMA obligation to return the funds. Yeah, but they are they are going to back the program. Ninety ten of the eligible activities, which we do get, uh, we submit everything in advance, um, so we'll know beforehand which properties are eligible or ineligible that's what's different from our right-of-way program um, so as we move forward we'll know what our budget is and how much it's going to cost before but once we start bidding and procuring a contractor you know it's hard to to put the brakes on the program if it gets too costly you either can you know you're either going to do it or you're not going to do it so and our so, cost share would be what a little over 200 something thousand or mm -hmm. yeah i think we need to 
pursue it. I think we need to do Well, we've already we've already committed to it. Yeah, we already told people we're going to do it. I mean, we, we, we have in place. We have people who have not pushed to the road because they knew this program was going to come. Okay. So we can't change in the middle stream. So I, I agree with that. Yeah, we, so, we've committed to it. So there's no sense in trying to back out of it. No, we do it. All right. So it's on the agenda today. Authority to advertise for us to procure a contractor and get bids to see what it's going to really cost us to do this uh, program. We'll go ahead and uh, issue a task order to Roston or to remonitoring firm, and they'll get more involved. And they even can help us identify properties. I'm sure there's, there's properties out there, people didn't apply for the program. Um, we would like to use their staff to help us canvas the entire <coughs> parish, identify properties that may be abandoned, and include that in this program. Well, let, let me ask you something. I, 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 I know before we said uh, it's dependent on FEMA deciding whether that uh, should be part of the program. Has FEMA did their part? Have they uh, reviewed it? No, we haven't submitted our application yet. We so have to all, submit everything all. on the front end. So we have to have the picture of the property. We have to have all the paperwork signed, which was a part of this application process. Roston's going to take all of the properties, all the democracy documentation, and submit it to FEMA, and then they'll go through and at their discretion tell you what's eligible and ineligible. Now, just because FEMA says that it's ineligible doesn't mean we can't do it. It's just when you submit it, if they, out of 100 properties, they think 25 is ineligible, if you still want to claim those properties, you pay 100% of those 25 properties, and FEMA will reimburse you for the other 75. So that's why I said once we get into it, you know, you're going to commit local funds because we're going to submit everything. We'll know going in what's eligible and ineligible, but if we're going to clean up the parish, I think we should clean it all up regardless of eligibility if we submit it. You know, if they pull out a few pieces, then we're just going to have to cover the cost of that. If so the people's got their insurance, they're yes. they won't be qualified, right? Correct. It doesn't mean that they won't be qualified, but if, if it's $13,000 to clean up the property they received, 5000 then FEMA will, will, will cover the rest. But they'll have to sign over their $5,000 to FEMA right. first. Right. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. And, and, we, and we're not shutting down the, the, the amount of people that can enter the project, right? <laughs> no, sorry. Everyone is open to anyone. <clears throat> right. So, uh, I mean, Katie, Katie, that's just a house, where the house is. That's not counting their pastures and all that. We have, yeah, we have tree stumps in there, too, and we have a pasture, a large debris, not the smaller debris, but even large debris. Uh, they got like so many people barns. got, got yeah, like, acres of grass and stuff. How can we pay to pick that up? Well, we, well, we, we should be picking of, up grass. Yeah, you're not picking that yeah, up, but like the large silos stuff. that are on oh, property, like stuff like that, it's something that's really large that they can. It's not just tin in, the, in, in an open field. It's going to be structured. Okay. We have, we have, in, well, in my particular little world in Grand Lake, we have a lot of big stumps, these giant stumps that I know the resident I ain't going to be able to get and, rid of. And FEMA, if it's uh, more than 50% of exposed roots, FEMA usually will deem that eligible. <clears throat> So, but if it's just someone went and, and cut the tree at the stump and left it, that's usually ineligible. Yeah. It has to actually have I'm talking solution. about big old oak trees that is just blown over the root balls mm -hmm. all out the ground. Now, we also, through this program, we have the uh, CPR Go. They're going to be another resource for the parish because as we canvass uh, all of the parish and we decide what's eligible and ineligible. Some of that stuff that we think may need to be cleaned up and it is going to be ineligible, we can maybe refer them to the CPR group and they can help coordinate volunteers or maybe provide funding to send people out there to clean up this property. So that's how we plan to handle any properties that are ineligible that we feel maybe still need to be cleaned up. Because at the end of the day, we still want all of the parish clean. It reflects on us all. We don't want to have a lot of abandoned property. And so we're going to make sure that we include every property, whether it's FEMA or a CPR go volunteer effort. Good. Good. And, and on these properties, they're going to only pay for what is coming off the properties. They're not going to be like it was at a dump site to carry five yards, cubic yards, and they get paid for 20. It's, no, what happened it's in the Grand Lake be, area? Exactly. What comes from the property? They're going to base it off of what comes off the ground, mm -hmm. not with the trucks dumping. Yes. Okay. 
Item. Thank you, Kate. Okay. Okay. Tom Baird, the Cameron Post Office. Tom. <coughs> Item number three. Good morning. I'll try to be brief. Uh, as you may know, or may not know, the, the, the post office here in Cameron, uh, the building itself is not at elevation. Uh, of course, the public wants to know why not them, as I want to know. So your staff and I have sent uh, emails back and forth to District 6, FEMA, people saying, hey, can we get a response? The U.S. Post Office says we don't have to follow local ordinance or state rules because we're the federal government and we can decide we're preempt or exempt. Uh, that's a fair statement that, that the federal government laws preempt state laws and local laws. It's kind of an hierarchy and we're on the, we're on the bottom of that. Uh, I don't know that they have to or they don't have to comply with our elevation requirements. They're the ones that make us uh, enforce that on us. Um, and we haven't really gotten, so we've asked for an explanation. What are we supposed to tell the public when they ask why not the federal government? And they've not provided us an answer. Uh, they have corresponded, they mean FEMA and the U.S. Postal Office have talked that they won't give us those emails of their conversation back and forth, but ultimately they have said, we're not going to tell you anything more, we don't have anything more to say about it, it is what it is. So with that said, I've asked the permit department to reach out to the property owner, because maybe through the contract, the lease contract, sometimes lease contracts say the tenant has to comply with laws and regulations and whatnot. Um, we haven't seen the contract yet, but I understand the property owner is willing to provide us a copy of that, so I will evaluate that and see if we can backdoor the enforcement of uh, our post office. Uh, uh, I, you know, ultimately, what we do, if anything, will be up to you uh, because we can still enforce our, our the requirement of elevation on the property. So when we have an issue with a property owner and there's a tenant on the property and the tenant owns the structure that's not elevated and we permit department brings me the, the file to file suit to enforce the ordinance. We include the tenant, structure owner, as well as the property owner, because ultimately it really affects the property owner. So in this case, we can still file a suit to enforce uh, our ordinance against the property owner. Um, of course, we don't, that's not our intention, but, but ultimately that's an end goal that you have to decide. Uh, but we're not there yet. I'll get the lease, hopefully, review it, maybe we can do something there. But I don't come back to you and give you another report. But I was hoping I'd have it by now, or just we just haven't gotten that lease contract. So, any questions? Anybody got a question? Well, it's Tom Binger up there. We got a, a green card from you. Uh, oh, oh, we'll yeah, talk okay. about that. Sure, well, thank you. Um, so, some time back, years maybe, um, you had approved uh, litigation for the opioid crisis. Uh, that litigation is proceeding with you know outside counsel firms that are doing that class action type stuff. And we received an email from uh, our counsel uh, who, uh, so Purdue Pharma, Purdue Pharma, P-H-A-R-M-A, Pharma uh, Limited Partnership is in bankruptcy, one of the major uh, defendants in that litigation. And the, in the bankruptcy proceeding, uh, there's five million dollars, five billion with a B that has been put into a settlement uh, fund, but it requires the public agencies, you being one of them, to uh, accept and approve that uh, bankruptcy proposal and settlement. Um, so we don't have, if we do nothing, then we automatically are opted into the settlement program, which is the recommendation of several layers of committees and attorneys and whatnot is to, to accept that recommendation because otherwise that money would go away uh, in the bankruptcy proceeding. So it's kind of either you do it or you lose it. Um, I just wanted to inform you that's what's happening. Again, it doesn't take any action on um, just us not doing anything if we automatically opt in. I, of course, will call the, unless you have any objections, uh, I'll call the lawyers and say, look, we have no objection. We're, we're, we want to be part of the settlement program. But if you do have an objection, we can discuss it out. No problem. No problem. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good, Mr. Tom. Thank Great. You. Anything else? Uh, All right. I think that's it. Yeah. Not yet.
Okay. Review agenda. Green cards. We've got another. We've got one more green card. Mr. Mark Nagel. I'd like to address the jury. Mark, you want to come up? Yes, sir. I just start with just saying thank y'all for having me and giving me this opportunity. And I will say hello, my name is Mark Daigle. First and foremost, I want to start by saying I mean no ill will to anyone by bringing certain concerns to light. As a lifelong Cameron Parish resident, it hurts to see our parish's people leave because it's easier than dealing with the parish's demands. The few of us who did not want to call somewhere else home we did it anyway. But there are some who think that does not have to fall into compliance with these rules. Canning's Groceries, for instance, per documents I requested from the Cameron Parish Police Jury Office in the remarks section of the building permit, it states as follows. During temporary construction phase, a finalized, detailed, engineered, architect, stamp plans, of the 8 inch CMU block wall will be submitted to show how the structure will be brought into compliance with the Cameron Parish Flood Damage Prevention Ordinance and Building Codes and Permits. This is the first document requested from the, for the six month temporary permit which follows FEMA's ordinance. The second portion of the remarks request a second separate document and states as follows at the end of construction a flood proofing certificate will need to be provided according to the police jury meeting on February 5th 2021 it was stated that Mr. Cannon needed to provide a finalized drawing that is in compliance with FEMA which he did not with that being said, I ask, how did Mr. Cannon go around all of these requirements requested in the documents and by the police jury members themselves to receive the permit? And that's all I have on that. Permit? Any questions? Any uh, reply? Yeah, I'll reply. You got six months and then we can... Uh, that? Maybe maybe enlighten public and to what he's agreeing to. Or I don't know what, to. what meeting y'all approved it at, but the jury voted for <coughs> businesses <coughs> temporary six months that they can operate and construct at that time during that time. Yes, sir. Okay. They, they at the end of this six months, whatever it is, I think it's in October. That's when I need all these other documents that Mr. Dago just stated. I'm going to need the detailed plans of the, how are they going to dry flood proof the building? And I'm going to need a letter signed by the engineer stating that that building was built and designed to be dry flood proof. That's FEMA's regulations. That's coming from FEMA too. So that's in October. That's the, the permit expires in October. Correct. The temporary so construction, up to October but at the end of, to but give it, you these documents that he's referring to. Right. Then we'll do it. Uh, we'll do another okay. permit. Then do the, then do we have we can extend it if he shows in good faith if we need to extend it to help him out or get, work that's with grants. That's going to be up to the jury. That'd be up to us to if we need to extend this to give him you know more time or whatever we need to do to get him in compliance. As he's working forward. As long, long as he's working forward to his objective or whatever. Am I right? That's correct. Okay. We did the same thing for the store and grand engineer. Yeah, yeah, day. yeah. Help the businesses out. May yeah. I ask Mr. Miles one question? Am I allowed that? Sure. Mr. Sure. Miles, according to the meeting and the, and the paperwork, it clearly states that he showed documentation to come that he is going to be coming into compliance in six months. To the best of your knowledge, is any of the information he gave you in compliance at this moment with FEMA's ordinance 44 CFR? 60.3 section C number three. No, not at this time. He's got six months to get it to us. Okie dokie. Thank y'all for y'all's time. Okay. Any staff report? Yes, we have a, a few things on the agenda. I'll start with the first one. 
agenda item 10, authority extend the current temporary food truck. You tabled it the last uh, meeting on the agenda meeting, and we're getting close to that expiration, which is um, in September. So are you guys ready to, to vote on that? Do you want to extend? it for another six months? Do you only want to extend it for a certain area of the parish or do you want to let it expire and we go back to following our ordinance which does not allow food trucks at all? I, I think we ought to uh, allow for another six months just in the town of Cameron yeah. you know and uh, and make it clear that at the end of six months that's when FEMA is going to be done in February anyway yes. that this is going to go away. It is in You're line with the compliant. FEMA ending date also right that's good that's going to be equivalent with them so i guess we're going to re extend it for one time for we're going time. to extend it but for a certain section of the person. in the right. village in the of cameron, cameron, cameron only cameron. that's what y'all yeah. want in the village cameron, of cameron yeah, only we got we, we got three or four thousand people i think that's the way it was written up if i'm not mistaken huh? we wrote, we wrote not, it not at the beginning well, I think it was parish wide at the beginning just the town of cameron the village of cameron only okay yeah we got a lot of people working out the plan and when it expires in March, then so, we have our, our ordinary ordinance. No food trucks they, unless they you have your permit for fundraising. What they, about, need, they need to be trying to have okay. their business set up. Six more stuff, months you know? to get per, to permit. What, what about the Holly Beach experiment we was doing with that food trucks down? How's that going, Mr. Sonny? What, what is it? Three permits this year? Well, well, they, was doing, doing, they was going underneath a, a non-profit deal. No, not at Holly Beach. No, Holly no, Beach, we passed an ordinance. Holly yeah, Beach, yeah. they still have three permits issued for this year, and I think you allowed four. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't heard any complaints from anyone that. of you, Robin. No. So is it, is it part of our ordinance? Yes. 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 So, okay. You got Mr. Broussard back here. Maybe he can... Uh, more spot. I know, I know he is... How is it working? It's working. I wish there was more that would show up. <laughs> uh, the weather's just bad, you know, as y'all know, it's a lot of rain, but uh, we did have at least one, if not two, show up uh, through one or part of the days, and uh, it was well received. Well, uh, basically that's what I was asking, if there was any negative feedback or positive no. feedback. The reason, the reason we did that, we have no other uh, alternatives as far as right now, nobody's right. building anything. So uh, it's serving the public, and we're doing the very best we can. We, if, we, if we have any issues, I'm sure that the jury would be the first one to hear about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's going to be the, uh, on the agenda. That's item 10. And I'll change that, Katie, to read in the Village of Cameron. Only. Okay. Um, let's see, item 12. Um, we, if you recall, we advertised to get a contractor to come in pre-event and if we decide after another hurricane instead of FEMA contractors coming in and doing the substantial damage determinations we want to hire our own company our own contractor so that's what that is um, Hunt Kiat Associates was the highest ranked proposer so we would recommend uh, authority for Mr. Scott to sign a contract with them for this is a pre-event contract. So if we don't have up any hurricanes for the next 10 years, then we don't owe them any money. It's only if we decide that we need them. Are they going to meet with the homeowners individually uh, so that they can have some input on this decision? Yes, that's what the goal is and with our staff. We're going to have staff members with them um, and, and we'll work with them directly. They'll get their directions from Mr. Miles, who's our chief building code official. He'll give them exact directions on which parts of the parish to, to go and inspect, which ones to stay away from. You're really only supposed to do that in flooded areas. And um, FEMA, they did it everywhere, their contractors. So we'll have a little bit more control over what communities are gonna be inspected and have more input and instead of those windshield assessments that FEMA conducted, well, FEMA's contractors conducted, where they just made assumptions instead of actually looking in the house. So we think that'll save us a lot of a lot of heartache in the future. So that's gonna be item 12. Um, and then, let's see. Item 20 is approved GIWW burn budget allocation. That's in your, in your packets. 
Um, last meeting, Mr. Garvin was here from Finster Maker. He presented all of the different options and phases. Um, you guys wanted to think about it. We still want to run all of this through CPR and um, and go talk about permitting, but before Finster Maker will do any further work, we would have to give them a budget allocation for engineering and design. So this chart kind of shows you what the estimated cost for that engineering and design Where is that be. chart at? It's in the voting. Um, in our folder? It's in your folder, mm -hmm. yes, sir. Um, it's behind. Under item it's, number what? It's behind item number 20. 20? So it'll be at the end. CPRA will have a seat as we'll have a meeting called with um, Finster Maker and our parish staff. Once we decide which ones we want to pursue and fund, then we'll make sure that they have an opinion on it and make some recommendations. Right. We don't want to go over there and start trying to do something and they don't approve of what we're doing. We're just beating a dead horse. So mm -hmm. we'll get their blessing before we kind of decide. But we're going to stress to them what we would really like to see happen. That, is that the levy? That's the levy. Yeah, that's the one right. we want. Yeah. Right. That's number three. And, uh, yeah, and then they're putting in the pumps. But we'll see We'll see what they say about all of it. You know, Then we'll really come back. And that's. I think that's when we'll start doing engineering work when we find out what they really approve and we'll get with everybody. And right. Now there are grant hazard mitigation grant funds still available that pay for this first feasibility study. Um, so a portion of this will be funded through hazard mitigation grant funds. We can also apply for additional funds to get us there, but it's not guaranteed, of course. Um, but I think it's time for us to start, you know, funding a few things up front to get it shovel ready, regardless of, of federal funding. Yeah, they have all this funding coming down. If we're not shovel ready, we just miss it. Exactly. Right. We can't apply for it. Right. Be ready. Well, I'll state it again. That uh, we can do all these projects we want, but you can go yourself and look at that water in that intercoastal and how high it is and how high it stays. And until we get rid of that, you can build all the levees you want. And the only way to get rid of that is to get on the core to dredge that intercoastal. And we're going to build levees and we're going to build marsh recre uh, creation uh, zones that you see when you come over Gibbstown. Boy, that's nice and pretty to look at over there to the right when you come in the south. But none of that's going to work until you get the water off of these people. And I don't understand why we're going to keep dumping money and dumping money on these dang little old projects that's only going to divert water one way or the other. And that, that just floors me that we're not taking a bigger step to get to the people that's going to make a difference in this east side of this Calcasieu Lake project. We, we fooling ourselves. I'm telling y'all. Y'all can do all the little projects y'all want, but they're going to crop up somewhere else. You're going to fix a little section here, it's going to crop up over there. First thing you know, you're going to be refixing what you done fixed. Well, we got to start somewhere, Lee. I mean, well, I start, start somewhere, flood. but we got to start somewhere where we're going to push, you're going to take, divert water from one section to another section. They know you, what you're doing it's any good. Out each side. The river is keeping it off the people. I mean, that's our job, and that's what they pay taxes for. Down well, that's here. my that's job to keep it off my people. Well, I'm working on, I'm working on the area. You need to work on your area, whatever's got to be done. Yeah, I know that. We'll, we'll start at... An, another effort. I mean, we've, we've been talking to the Corps, requesting information, analyzing data, but we'll call another meeting, see if we can get them. To I done the heard this, and we we done supposed to get it with the Corps. And I ain't got to this day an answer on the, that they can tell me what the height of that water is. Exactly. On the That's our whole problem. They yeah. won't tell us. Right. Mm -hmm. We can't get that information. They've raised the water level in the Intercoast in the last 20 years a foot. <laughs> And they're yeah, talking well, about raising it another both foot. Both sides of the Intercoastal. You and know they, what I'm saying? And so. they're talking about raising it another, another foot. What do you, you think you've got problems now? Let them raise it another foot. All them levees you building, that ain't going to ain't work. All that stuff, them zigzags they're putting in the marsh, that's going to be covered with water. 
Ain't nothing gonna grow on it. Uh, the killing projects by allowing that water to be held higher in that intervals. Have we gotten anything from the regional drainage group? No, they're that, looking that at this I mean, issue. Yeah, they, they, you know who they're looking for? You know who they're looking after? They're looking at all the parishes north. Boy, they got good drainage. And it all comes on Cameron Parish and boom. And we go, boom. They all drain. We like this. We, we, we can't get it out. Because we got an intercoastal waterway that passes through. Yeah. But that the water's got a drain. I guess the point we agree that that's the issue, but if we don't get help and we don't consolidate. I like, I like to see the data on what the intercoastal water level has been for the last 20 years. Did they really raise it, you know? But I can tell you where I live and Kim Booyah, right now we have alligator grass and it's been like that for the last six years because we can't even cut our yard. The back ridge in the back, we used to hunt turtles on that. Now that stays with six, eight inches of water. There's no more ridge back there. <laughs> so the water come from somewhere, you know what I'm saying? Right. It, it, it's holding the level it, up too high. It, exactly right. I mean, I've seen the water. First time in my life I lived by the Grand Lake Bridge of 200 yards from it. First time in my life was about two months ago when we was in that big flood deal that they call it. You couldn't pass aluminum boat under the bridge. People had to, couldn't use our boat launch to to go fish, they had to go launch at Gibbsdale because you couldn't pass under the bridge. Uh -huh. The water was so hot. And, and I guess the point I'm making is that we have to come up with some type of plan that's bought into by the regional, our local, to push forward so mm -hmm. that these things aren't piecemeal and they're addressing the main issue, which is in I agree course. with that. I agree. They need to drop that water. We level need to go we, down. But it's easier for them to raise that and put bigger cargo through there than it is them to dredge it. That's know? right. But the water's coming on us. Yeah, well, we got Fond Dyke and Lyre, they're rice fields. They can't even flow into the intercoastal like they used to do when they get rid of the water. They got to pump it now because the intercoastal is higher than the ground on the, in the rice field. The fact <laughs> is, they used to pump water out of the intercoastal to flood the fields. Right. And that, because that water source is not dependable, they had to dig wells. And not only that, now they're having to put pumps in to pump water out of the fields. They can't drink. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, uh, it's crazy. What is, the crazy. Possi what is the possibility that we could get somebody from the Corps mm -hmm. to come to a meeting? We went to D.C. to meet them and wouldn't yeah. meet. They wouldn't Correct. meet with us. Uh -huh. Yeah. Until we get to the people that's going to make a difference, and that's the senators and representatives. Well, and that, I don't know if we couldn't follow suit against the Corps. I mean, I don't know if they exempt or what, but say it might be worth a chance. Yeah. But I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna take millions of dollars and spend them on projects out in the marsh to build marshes up, and then you're just gonna allow the Corps to not do their maintenance and destroy all that, what are we doing? Yeah, but what, what I'm saying again, I'm gonna reiterate: we know what the problem is. We feel it. We understand. We live here. But we have to be able to put that down on paper. It has to be certified by somebody doing a study mm -hmm. that they will accept. And if we don't get to that phase of it, we won't ever change anything. Mm -hmm. So my, my deal is how do we get from what we know is wrong and start a plan to fix it so we can push that plan forward. That's, that's all I'm saying. Oh, we may have. have to we hire may. an engineering firm to do an H&H &H study and but without the data, the history to prove it, it's, it's kind of our word against theirs, which that's what we were trying to get our hands on. And they did submit um, all of their, a, a large file to Fenster Maker, and they were analyzing it. So I'll touch base back with Gorgon. I know that's what he was working on. And, yeah. maybe and we'll try and get that meeting scheduled again. Maybe we ought to put these people also on the payroll to, to study this situation and, and have some valuable data that we can go and fight. Dig out the intercoastal and start putting that back on the side of the property back up. I'll get, uh, I'll get with, with Fenster Maker, see how much headway they made with the data that were, they received. I think it took them nine months just to get it from the core. And um, <laughs> that, I, that I started paying attention, it might have been longer than that. Um, but I'll get us a meeting, and Mr. Lee, I'll make sure that you're invited to the meeting with Mr. Maker if you want. We can do it. Always said, always said, if we can ever get some information about the history, that then we could go to the core, and then we could go to the senators and representatives that the core will listen to mm -hmm. and say, hey, this is what's going on. 
with their own data. I'll get a meeting scheduled with them and we'll we'll see what we came up with and where the next step can be. I see. Sir, are you have, you have your hand raised up? Yes, I do. Can I, I, I got in here late, I guess, and the green card was picked up. I had some stuff I wanted to address about Holly Beach. Uh, first of all, come to the mic. Can anyone Stay be on mind? Can you come to the mic? Okay. Well, first of all, my name is Troy Reshord. Uh, my father bought a camp in Holly Beach in 1946. Y'all developed Holly Beach off of our property as a landmark after Audrey. Uh, a few things I have to address is these trash bins on Holly Beach. We have a, beach, we have a, a camp on Egret. They got the trash bins out there. I know they put them there for us for when the dump was closed for the hurricane. The dump is back open. We're smelling fish shrimp and crabs and it is disgusting it needs to be addressed we can pay for somebody at the dump on a sunday afternoon to work out the hours people on the beach can bring their stuff to the dump that's the problem y'all shut the dump down at three o'clock i understand y'all had to make a schedule but sunday evenings one person is a lot cheaper than five dumpsters that stink everybody up that's the first thing i wanted to address uh, Egret Road, I'm being told that we can't drain Egret Road in the Gulf. All the sewage on every camp on the front is being pumped to Brant, going out. Egret Road is flooded now with salt water. The sand we can't go to the beach because the sand is so loose because they built <coughs> dunes up. It's common sense that we're not using. If y'all don't want a four wheel on the beach, give access to people to get to the beach with their vehicles that are licensed. They are all parking on me. I can't even get on my property. Because they're all parking along the roads. I'm on tarpon. I'll tell you where I'm at. I gotta ask people, please, can you move so I can get out of my own place? That's how bad it gets on weekends sometimes. Uh, I got a question on that one then, because I've seen do you, uh, is there a section of Holly Beach, is that, there's no fours, no new side by sides or anything, is that? Well, they just started enforcing this 4th of July weekend about the four wheelers. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's been on the books. It just hasn't been enforced. It's been on the books. They had signs up. They changed the signs. The new signs didn't say Holly Beach. After the hurricanes, they changed them back to where they do say four wheelers. Now, I have not have a four wheel drive truck. I use a full side by side to go from our camp to haul chairs to the beach and haul my family. We got 72 people that come to our camp. I'm being told I can't do that anymore. But I can't get to the beach. We get my, I'm the youngest in the family. We're all getting old. We can't walk out there and try to set up our family members. It's tiresome. I got two of them. Ones. That's beside the point. But anyway, we want access. For the public to go to the beach. And the only way you're going to do that is go back to the old way. Who planted grass on a dune? That ain't natural. I've been there all my life. Egret grain to the Gulf of Mexico. Always has. But now all of a sudden they can't. And I want to know why. You want to say something about pumping egret into the ditch behind us. Because they can't let that water go in the Gulf. So you're going to pump water from Egret Street and mess up an ecosystem in the canal that's going to turn around and go to the channel, mess up the ecosystem in the channel, and it's going to go anyway. So common sense tells you the cheapest thing for the parish to do is let it go. Let the drains go the natural way. Brad Street is the high ground of Holly Beach. You're not going to change it. You can't make water go up here. Tell you what, Emily, can you? I can um, explain to you about the egret street. After Hurricane Rhea, FEMA mm -hmm. came down. We did all our inspections. Ms. Lee Falk was the road superintendent at the time. They said the only way that they would put egret street back is if there was no ditches on the side of the road. That's why all the rocks were there, and you could not drain anything. That came from FEMA. That came from FEMA. Where did the dunes come from? State. I didn't make the dunes. 
State that. makes the I have do that. So part. you put a dune, a, a four foot dune here, and you got brand on four foot, you got a big, you got egret by you. You don't have egret street. I did not put any dunes back. We didn't haul the dunes back. But I'm I, saying. But with the dunes. But I'm being told I can't knock the dunes down. I can't, I can't get the water drain. I'm being no, told I cannot the, do that. The dunes are like that everywhere. It don't matter if you in um, Grand Isle or wherever, you can't destroy a dune. No, we didn't state. make that rule. That comes from the state. And the beaches is owned by the state, it's not owned by the parish. Correct. And the ordinance was put in effect a long time ago, way before Rita, about where you could drive and where you couldn't. That ordinance would have to probably be abandoned or readjust. There's a beach board that normally, I think, did all that with the speed limits a long time ago, because it's certain sections of where you can drive and where you can. Well, everybody so that Holly would have to be revisited to be able to get to Holly Beach, because right. you can't drive on it. It's sugar sand. It's right. not like it used to be. Because of because of it's, the dunes, it's off. Because of the dunes, I'm telling you, I've been there all my life. <laughs> well, back in the day, we could do things. Well, yeah. we did things. Right. Uh, when I first worked for the for the jury, we used to go out there and we'd haul sand and haul uh, seagrass and we'd haul fish and we'd haul everything up and down the beach to make it all pretty in front of Holly Beach. I seen me work for a week and a half straight on Holly Beach getting it ready for the 4th of July. The state, the federal government, and everybody else come in and they dump money in it, and, and they, then they tell you what you can and can't do. And to drain sewer water, if you're gonna drain it in a ditch, it cannot go directly to the, to the Gulf. You have that already? No. Everybody on Grant Street has to pump to Grant Street. That's right. And Grand Street drains back this way. It drains to it drains to the to the, to the north, channel to the canal. canal. Okay. To the north. Nobody's pumping in the e -grade. Right. There's no reason e can't go out. So why can't we uh, open a drainage, a uh, water drainage through the dunes, and Thank build you. a road up? That would be something to do with coastal zone. That ain't gonna be us because um, we have a hard time just to even be able to. Yeah, but we're talking about <laughs> rainwater. We can't even, we're not allowed to cut the beach. Like we're used to be able to cut the entrances and all that. We're not even allowed to do that anymore. So you're telling me that you can't Somebody. drive from from 82 to to the beach, to get on the beach? Water-wise, salt water-wise. Water comes, high tide comes over the dunes, gets on Grand Street and floods all of Grand Street with salt water. Do you want to ride your vehicle in the salt water? I don't. I don't want anybody ever want to drive a vehicle in salt water. Let's take well, we always had access <laughs> to the beach. Yeah, but when the tide comes up now, it's different. It's not like it used to be. Even egret was underwater. FEMA came down to do their inspections. They couldn't do egret. They called like three or four different times, and they couldn't go to Cameron Drive because it stayed underwater, and they refused to go to even look at it as long as the water was on it. And again, well, we need to talk about we state. Just let's talk about state regulations. Let's talk about parish reg regulations. Yeah, I understand, start that. With. I understand that, but. Uh, Maybe there's I'm a, sure but, we can address this some kind of way well, to straighten you know, it up. There's a lot. There's a lot of issues that are involved in that. There's and, private and property one of them has to and do with state. wetlands. They're trying to designate half the beach as wetlands, which I it drives me crazy. Our personal property is wetlands. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and that was created from hurricanes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I and find it hard to believe. The dunes would have filled in by now. A dune could be considered a wetland, but in some cases it is. That hole you're talking about on the beach right there, we've been trying to get that peel since way before Laura. It was a hole there already. And every time the storms come in, it washes that out, and they won't let us put it back. I mean, we've, we've asked to put it back. They won't let us put it back. So uh, we, we got the drainage board. They're supposed to be trying to get some pumping. I think they got one, one set of pumps in. They're supposed to be put three sets of pumps in along that uh, beach trying to pump everything to the north. So we're doing what we can. One of, the things, one, of, one of the things about Hollow Beach is that you got to understand there's a lot of people there. And anytime there's a lot of people, there's a lot of different <coughs> points of view. Uh, the the uh, dumpsters, we've been asked, we've been requested by numerous people to put dumpsters, to add dumpsters. We don't have enough dumpsters, yada, yada. Uh, and she can back that up. And then where they put them at is always going to be a problem. Uh, the fact that people driving on a beach, everybody thinks that when they have a camp in Hollow Beach that while I live there, I should be able to access the beach. I, I feel your pain. This is America. We should be able to do certain things in our area. But anytime you got that number of people together, you got the knotheads that come in on these four wheelers and racing bikes and everything else that go out there and make it a hazard for kids to be on the beach. 
So they come up with ordinances to restrict the vehicle traffic. It's for safety purposes. It's not because we want to put, put our foot on somebody's neck. It's because it has to be done for the safety of all the public, not just for individuals. I have no problem, there's no, and there's no way to differentiate to say, okay, I give you a tag and you can go on the beach. And I can't get the next guy a tag? I mean, you know, everybody has to have access or nobody has access. Correct? I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And so, I believe everyone should have access. That has been a, that has been a tradition in my family for years to be able to access Holly Beach. All right, but you and know, why would we want to change it? But you know, there was access in, 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 in Texas beaches. There was access, and if I ain't mistaken, I don't know if you can still drive at, at Grand Isle anymore. I don't no, think. No, no, there was access no. to all these beaches, but well, not Cameron anymore. To step up. Not anymore. This is something that has been our heritage. Not anymore because no. of the safety factor. It's all come down to a safety factor. So, uh, I, you I, know, they, they, they said that somebody got flipped over, a drunk man flipped over one in Holly Beach, and somebody got hurt. In Mays Beach, so they put, shut down all the four wheelers. Well, a woman got killed between here and Holly Beach on the road Saturday. Are you going to shut that road down? That's a stupid people. I mean, people are going to have accidents. People are going to be drunk. I'd much rather be in a four wheeler than in an automobile drunk driving up and down the beach. But that automobile will take out more people. Yeah, it, it's just common sense. I want everybody to understand that. I'm not trying to be right. objective to anybody here. Y'all all have a job to do. And I'm saying that. I know sense. But what do we need to do to get it to where it's right for everyone? I know Make people have it. Two complaints came in about four wheels from Holly Beach, and I'm willing to admit every dollar I have that neither one of them are from Holly Beach. They're from out of, out of here. Well, well, now wait a minute. You want to talk about people that's not from Holly Beach? How many people are putting in them dumpsters that don't live in Holly Beach? How many people was Put putting in, in them dumpers and, and on, the, on the beach and burying their sewage on the beach? I've watched it myself, standing there watching them put their sewage in the sand. Hey, that right there, I that right there. I don't That right there and the people that put the trash in there, they don't pay taxes in Cameron Parish. I, I, I don't condone it. I really At all. Don't. The trash alone. Right. You talk about the trash. Right. Bring it to the uh, bring it to the dump. To the dump. When I was the door down there, I didn't want that. I didn't want that at all, because that is not our trash. That don't belong Take to Cameron Parish. Well, we'll that costs to. Cameron Parish is what it does. It yeah, but, it cost it, but if you don't let them put it in the well, dump, they put it on the side of the road. The reason if you don't if you don't have a dumpster, it's on the road. It's exactly. on the road. It's on the road. It costs right. more money. That's right. So well, it costs you more hey, money. What, what? You're picking up them dumpsters, it costs you more money than that person yeah. staying at the dump and getting rid of it. You're getting rid of it anyway. One quick question. Uh, we still have a beach district in, in Holly Beach. Yes. Is Miss Miss Boudreaux still on that? Okay, I'm not sure of the board members. Okay, we have to check. Craig, do we still have a committee of the beach mm -hmm. on Holly Beach? We have a beach board. Yes. Oh, you got a beach board. Yes. Michelle Long it's is on it. kind of just dissipated. No. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe it's time. Since before Hurricane Laura. Maybe it's time we get right. that started back. Yeah, because we, we, work, we work with that committee more than anything else. And the same thing, we, we do have one further down. I know, I thought Holly Beach was in that. Well, I guess I need to get a committee on yeah. Well, one a bit. But, I, but, but, but that's where the best place to voice your deal. Get a consensus. <laughs> but, but, but get a consensus as to what the yeah. people want so we can work we'll toward that board. Well, you're not from, you're not from, you're not But from do they, do y'all live here? No, actually, my dad's from Youngville. That's mama from Henry. Okay. The you gotta, is what this is. You got to understand this, you gotta understand this so. jury they is the only they wanting to, to try to do what the people want. And that's the only reason why yeah. I'm speaking my piece in front of him because I know it's being recorded. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I don't want harm to nobody in no way, shape, or form. But we got to quit yeah. communism. We actually have the issues on, on Redford Beach, Beach too with drainage. Since the storm came in and pushed all this sand further north, we lost a few. We got sand this deep, right next to the roads, and we cover all the drainage ditches up. And we are to work on that issue right now. That's a oh, tough question. If it don't have, if it don't have grass on it, just loose sand, and we move it around. Don't get permission. That's the question I'm going to answer. Don't get permission. That's, a, that's a, the state. That's I mean, the state. It's the state, bro. We can't say yes or no. That's the state issue. So who do we need to go to the state? To state we land management. Yeah. Uh, just do. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> just for the so Bears Road. Just for the Bears Road. Isn't Pelican a Paris Road? Where's Pelican? 
Um, of course, pelicans. That doesn't well, exist. Egret? Pelican. Yeah. Pelican don't yeah. exist anymore. Pelican's not there. They didn't go See, that's home. You still got other signs of poles out there. It, it don't, it don't exist. It don't, it's not a part of our record. And about five or six more roads that's in the Gulf is not part of our record anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's true. Can we, can we get Pelican back? <laughs> the beach goes back up, maybe. I don't know. Well, I, the beach I, is hot, man. I ain't been out there. You can, if you clean the sand off of Pelican, you'd have enough sand to fill every hole in Holly Beach. Pelican is in the water. That's fine. Yeah. And if you took over Pelican, that's Parish, there's your sand. All you want to fix up everything to make okay. everybody happy. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, Mr. Right. Richard, we'll get a meeting call with the, the <coughs> district, and I'll make sure that we get you guys invited, and it's a time that's convenient, and we'll start trying to get that. Nine three. Seven five four. Twenty two zero eight. Thank you, Mr. Richard. Thank you, sir. Oh, ma'am. My, my only concern, um, as far as it goes, is traveling on the beach and whatnot. Um, we have no one that cleans Holly Beach besides us residents that actually live there. Um, all we take on the beach is our side-by-sides, our pool wheelers, our golf carts with trash bags. My kids, me, myself, family, anybody. And that's how we keep our beach clean. But now we're being told that we cannot do that. So what can y'all provide to us to keep our beach clean now? Well, don't y'all have, don't have uh, dispensers for trash bags over there? Yes, there's dispensers for trash bags, but who's going to actually go out there and pick up the trash left behind? Because Maybe, yeah. no, oh, one no. Picks it up, no one picks it up besides us on our four wheelers, side by sides, things like that. We literally in one day, a few hours, we can pick up about three, four trash I bags. I believe you. I know it, it happens on Redford Beach too, and then that's what we keep trying to preach to the people that come visit our beaches. Take your trash, bag it up, and take it back with you, or go put it in a dumpster. Don't just leave it there. But it'll stay so we there have the same issue too. It'll on stay this there side. if we don't go pick it up. So that's my that's my concern. Like if I can't go out there, if I can't go home right now, jump on my golf cart, grab my kids, and say, hey, let's go clean up the beach, without a cop coming down and saying, hey, you can't be here on that golf cart because it's not allowed on this beach. But I'm participating to clean the beach. But it's everybody in general. When you come out there, you would you would actually see the people that's riding those things and riding golf carts side by side school wheelers. A majority of them are taking their trash, and right. it's an easy way to access the beach. But when everyone leaves and goes home, it's left to us residents to go Pick out there trash. and clean those areas, and we can't even do that right now because we want they're wanting to sign. I tell you what, best thing to do probably is, is get with Miss Katie, get y'all's board together, whatever board you have left, get with Sonny. And, um, and go from there. Yeah, you're you need your board, board, you need those board getting active again. Yeah. Yeah. Look, so. a lot of this trash is not people putting it down. A lot of it comes in with the tide. So I'm not, we're not pointing fingers at people that put it there. Right. It's just we want to get it clean. And, and right. is, it, is it something that I may have to start a petition for in order to Jeez. overturn this ordinance? Because if, if it's something I need to start a petition for, I'm absolutely... For that, I, I will take. Guess we need to look it up. We have to check. We we'll have to check. Plan. We'll have to check. Make sure the state doesn't have any any kind That's, of control yeah. with that too. Yep. Yeah, we, we, they can look. I change. guess we get with they get this board together and uh, get with Miss Katie and Miss Sunny and kind of look at this audit and see what. Yeah, we're and and I'll just kind of explain a few things. So they're absolutely right. The only beach that Cameron Parish has any control over is Rutherford Beach because they have a lease directly with the state of Louisiana. So that's why you see a lot of activity with the beach board over there because they actually have the improvement. Now if the lease were to ever lapse then all of that infrastructure and money that that beachfront district spent automatically becomes property of the state. <laughs> so you take a risk when you invest money. Now that beachfront district was very active. They wanted to invest their money, so they got the lease. They invested their own money. Your side doesn't have an active board that was willing to either, maybe you just didn't have the avenue to execute a lease with the state. We can help that beachfront district. If you want to identify property that you want to manage and invest funds in, then we can help you negotiate a lease agreement with the state and then your beachfront could manage it. The only other problem you're going to have is funding. You only get about $5,000 a year off of sell tax dedications right now from the state of Louisiana. Your other revenue source is actually um, your hotel motel tax. 
you get a percentage of that, which if you go stay anywhere, that 2% hotel fee that you see, that's what the hotel passes off on you as the renter. That's what goes and gets divided between tourism and two beachfront districts. The problem we have is we have all of these hotels, motels, RV parks, uh, Airbnbs that are renting property and they're not charging that tax to their renters. So you're almost, anyone in Holly Beach that's running property, if you're not passing that 2% off on your renter and giving it to the police jury to give to the beachfront district, then you don't have any money to do anything. So your only options are get involved with the beachfront district, make sure your people are passing that hotel motel tax. You can pass, like the beachfront district has authority to pass their own tax. You can pass a property tax or you could pass a sales tax. If you could get your voters in Holly Beach to pass for sales tax or, or property tax just for beachfront development, then the board could afford to hire full-time employees that would clean the beach. If you don't have that as a revenue source and you come to the police jury asking the police jury for money, the only money the police jury has that's unrestricted right now is general fund. And guess what the general fund pays for? It pays for the staff here. It pays for road and bridge supplemental. It helps pay for the sheriff's office. Everything the sheriff's office has, all their buildings, the police jury pays for that. The district attorney's office, the courthouse and jail. That money pays for the entire parish to run. So when you talk about how do you want to defund something else in the parish to fund cleaning the beach, that's always what the decision is. Do you want to not black top a road and pay for a full-time employee to clean the beach? Yes or no. That's what always the decision comes to head for the jury, and that's why it's difficult for the jury to allocate money just for that. All right, so, and, I, and, and, look, and not by any means am I begging y'all to the beach cleanup. Just overturn this ordinance of riding bikes on the beach. I go back and clean that beach every yeah. single day. It makes me no difference. I will clean it up, but I'm not about to get a citation but take them out of the park on the beach to get it clean. Then we'll call a meeting with the beachfront board, let them make a recommendation to change the ordinance, appeal it. It'll come through the jury. You have a whole hearing available for public sure. comment. Yes, sir. This is, this is a regurgitation of what mm -hmm. happened several years ago. <clears throat> we were asked not to bring it to the police jury. The, Ron said, Ron Johnson said he would, he would prefer to just turn his head. Now he's not turning his head anymore. So, I mean, I was here back then when, when mm -hmm. that was discussed and y'all didn't want to go through the process of changing ordinances and stuff like that. So maybe the best discussion would be with Ron. Maybe the yeah. best thing you get your board, is get uh, your board, board to come and make a recommendation to the parish on the ordinance y'all want. Mm -hmm. yeah. And until we can get a consensus from the board, right. we can't right. just listen to one set of residents right. and then we got 10 over here listening and saying the opposite thing. We need the board to come to us and say, this is what our people want that's on the beach. Bring it to us, we'll look at it, change your ordinance. Yeah. And first, and another thing, I need to find out what it takes to lease that beach from the state. I have a contact and we can work on that. We have to identify and we can designate that area. We'll lease the whole thing. Lease the okay. whole thing, there put you some gates up. Kate, do you have anything else? We have some agenda okay. items still. Okay. Yeah, we're not done. Um, are we off the, I guess we're off the, <coughs> so that's on the agenda back to the GIWW. Do you want to allocate funds to get a shovel ready for one, for all phases? What do you guys want to do? Do you still want to discuss it? But every meeting that we prolong it, that's just one meeting that we're further away from permitting something, which you need the part, the END designed enough to get permitted. Um, once you're shovel ready, then we can go and apply for all sorts of federal funds for construction costs. I'm not in favor of none of them. I, I'm in favor if it fits to a a larger plan of doing what Lee's asking to do. If, if it won't be detrimental in trying to get the GIWW. Uh, no, this thing got really nothing to do with the GIWW other than old I'm like Lee, I would like them to drop the water table in the GIWW, so yeah. I have a lot of problems. Well, if you do any of these projects, you're, you're holding water back look, north. Look, and when you hold water back north, you hold it in the <coughs> coast and not down there. But you're not, you're not looking at the picture. 
if you got if you got the whole Mermitol Basin, you got a swimming pool out there, and you poke nine straws through it in a bowl, it's gonna fill that bowl up real quick, but that Mermitol Basin ain't going nowhere. You know what I'm saying? It's like a big swimming pool. Swimming pool is not gonna affect that swimming pool, but it's gonna fill up that bowl real a lot where the where the people's living at, you know, and their property that they produce cattle and everything on. So you we, we say we're diverting the water. That little bit of water is not helping anything. The other day when the water got real high, there was 18 inches difference between the burn side and this side. Well, I went and put some plywood, had the guys put plywood to restrict the water, not to stop it, because there was still a bridge that was wide open. But we did deter the water enough until it went down in the burn side and, and equaled out that we didn't flood the East Creole Highway. The water was up on the curve. If I'd have got 18 more inches of water on the Creole side, letting it come through the Lichenier Road, you wouldn't ever be able to get to Lichenier because the bridge was out, you know? So, I mean. Yeah, what, but what, you, what, you, 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 but you, 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 if not, building, you're putting all these levees, when you're going to put a levy okay, from Gibstown past Murray, well, that, that, that's part of the project, brother. It's going behind Lichenier, the houses behind Lichenier. I don't give a shit. I mean, that water, if you stop off, if you stop off the burn, then you're stopping a lot of water in the Mermitol Basin from having a place to go. This is the project. No, no, this is like four. We don't have, we're not going to adopt all four of them. What we want to do is go meet DNR and say, look, we want a levy behind Lichenier. It's, that's what she just asked us. No, but we're going to go to DNR and see which one they want to support. That's the main thing out of these four. Because I don't want to go beating a dead horse and I'm going to try to do, get money to do something and they say, well, we're not in favor. Well, is there one of these four we can agree on? Yeah, the, the levy behind Lichenier and putting the pump system in the south on Murray. Uh, which is that? There's one going in Murray. Uh, so that's the north. Oro, Oro, that's Oro, the north. Oro, Kings uh, Bayou and by Lichenier. Those two projects out of the four is that I'm wanting to do the rest. Not, so which one what is this? So which what project still is still an option, but not recommended. I want to go just behind this here, the houses on this here. North Canal Improvement? That's one of them. And then what else? The levee behind this here. Humble Canal Drainage mm -hmm. Improvements? Uh, well, that's that's a project, but our main thing is to stop the water from coming across. King's Bay Drainage Improvements? King's Bay Drainage Improvements? King's Bay Drainage But then you got the GIWW Berm. That, that's another one. Weirs uh, uh, from. Yeah. I'm, I'm not looking at the that. last one. Too much. Just wash that's away what again. he's talking about. Yeah. He's Probably. talking about the I'm not going to stop the burns. If we stop up the burns, there's not a couple that's issues with that. You're stopping up. About. I don't know, Chad's here. He knows how many acres is out there, but you know, 40,000 acres where water that's coming from the north has a place to go for a while till it goes back out. Yeah. If we block that off, we're really hurting the Anacostal Canal. But if we just put it behind this chenier, uh, so are you so are you asking what do you want to find E and D to get some permitting on any of these phases right now? I would like to get that started because Ryan's telling me we have to be shovel ready when this money comes or we yeah. ain't gonna get it. That's right. Well, let's get one of them. Let's pick one get that, that one pollution. Well there's really two. There's one that the way he's rolled it up is in different sections, but we need the levy. It doesn't pay us to put wear systems and pump if we don't stop the water from coming on. We can't pump the burn. We can't afford that. So we have to have the levee behind Lichenier. To me, that's a key, a real key. And so then- The ridge north of Lichenier Road, uh -huh. is that one? Yeah, that they call it a ridge, they don't call it a levee. Yeah. And what, and that in conjunction with another phase, which is- Yeah, in conjunction with the phase on- uh, Humble Canal. King's yeah, Bayou putting the pump, pump system in. I forget which one you think. Got it in front of King's Bayou Pump and Canal Group. Right, mm -hmm. So that is about three, Point five million dollars. Yeah, and, and look, they put a they put a big price on it. You know, yeah, that's, that's what they do. And I called a, a, well, I'm a company. A, I, I like that. It's a million dollars just to put the levy, and they got like three million. On it, you know, are so. these permitted or not permitted? No, we just no, did a study. Mm -hmm. Now we got to go to engineering to get the work done. Design. But yeah. I want to go meet DNR to see which one they want to approve. Yeah, and then come to the, the biggest problem is only on those pumps. They, they, when, when they start restricting water from coming in and going out, the, the National Marine Fisheries give you holy hell. Well, that's why I want to meet with them first. And, and, and to get the permit, it's going to be a pain. I mean, that's what, but if you're going to go and say be shovel ready, you might be six, eight, a year out. For I mean, years already. Trying to you know what I'm saying? Do you, yeah. do you want us well, we've been to working on this over a year now, Sonny. I mean, just to get a study. Yeah. I mean, this is just, 
this is all hypothetical, you know, nothing's like engineered or designed right now. It might change what the project looks like once they sit down doing the design and we can make sure that they're they're meeting regularly with DNR while they're designing it, or do you want to meet with DNR first before you decide which one you Karen want to do? set up a meeting when she gets back off of uh, vacation to meet with DNR. So you want to table it for this meeting? And next month, then I'll have which one they want to. Because that's, okay. what, just table that's what we don't want to happen, is to give a green light to something we may not want. Or, okay. That's right. We spend money okay. on that. We so we'll table use. it this month. Until we get with DNR. And we were supposed to meet with them before, but we had some, some people out sick, and we just we okay. couldn't get the meeting scheduled before. Okay, so that was all the agenda items, really, that I needed to go over. The last one, Miss Wendy Harrington's going to go over with you guys, and she's got a lot of um, building bids and repairs ready to go through with you guys for authority. Hey, wait, before we get to Wendy, I, want, I got a yes, couple sir. questions for Emily about the our our covered crew and our ditch diggers. Can you give us an update on where they're at and what we're doing? Yes, sir. Um, Greg's still digging on the island. He's on 413 and 415. I'm doing his by like the parish roads because he's not in a uh, subdivision. Um, one of the two, the sub uh, two of the contractors that we hired. One is still cleaning in Paul Turner subdivision. That's a big a subdivision. It takes a while. Uh, they finished everything down Parish Line Road. The other contractor has moved off of he's on Brent subdivision. I think he's almost done with that. And he's getting ready to move. I think Forest Nunez. The um, granite crew. They're cleaning in the tan subdivision. Um, we're still trying to find a pump to put on the second carpet cleaner that's broke and we are in the process of trying to piggyback off of another parish to be able to buy the sewer cleaner. Um, they do have one in stock, we're just waiting for them to send us a letter and I, I think she's trying to get some vinyl approvals and stuff like that. Um, Hackberry's been changing out some cross culverts, we have some bad cross culverts there needs some parish road so they've been changing that out. James is cleaning, they cleaned Mildred Street. They've just about through cleaning, I think, Julie and Kurt Burley's subdivision. Um, I can't remember the name of it. Ridge Barber. Ridge Barber. I'm sorry, Barber oh, subdivision. Oh, um, Sherry and them, they um, had to do some um, shoulder repairs on Mermitall River Road. They're trying to put some limestone back on it. Um, while while we're talking about, go ahead, Jim. Uh, in the big stick, where is it at right now? Oh, one's in Cripple Creek, which is the McCain subdivision, and the other one is cleaning in Cameron here. So right. we still have and both of them cleaning. Are we, are we sending somebody, I know there's the two contract crews we got, are we sending somebody behind them checking the ditches and making sure that it's some of our, our people you or Shane going and looking at the ditches or With inspecting the them? On the lateral's and stuff? Yeah, on, yes, the, on, the, yeah, think, on the, Yes, I think uh, the drainage board actually in Grand Lake, uh, they, they hired uh, uh, us. They hired, they got a guy hired, the drainage board hired a guy to go <coughs> and evaluate all the drainage, yeah, yeah, laterals. Yeah. But I'm talking about our parish ditches. Oh, oh the parish ditches. ditches and stuff? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we haven't, uh, I mean, we, me and Shane actually, uh, both kind of road, he's going, okay. and I'm going like on the parish line and all that. Um, we have a couple other issues that we have to work on, but I need to call the cleaner. And the, um, okay. James is actually kind of using it, and then the yeah. waterworks have gotten the bind. We had to bring it down the other day because we're just, we are remember sharing that one for right now. Um, the Grand Chineer dump site, uh, we'll give you an update on that. Uh, we're going to be reopening that. Uh, hopefully it won't be too much longer. I'm waiting on the kids to come in. We're going to be putting an um, RV camper there instead of putting the building. The building has been torn down. And we're going to be working on the one off of uh, Square Road to see what it'll take to kind of put the, um, sit back in the camper and stuff. That way we can get them back open. Yeah. And if there is a storm, we can haul out the RV campers and we can utilize them because there's no places for anybody to stay, you know. Yeah, uh, no sense of putting and stuff like that. You can set it up to work in there if we need to. All right. Um. I'm good. I just want to check on them ditches, see where we at. Okay, on those two coverts on Lishnear Road, the one that's eaten out, I went yesterday and I see where they had to patch the asphalt because it's already up on asphalt eating through. So, Katie, I think we're working to see if, uh, with Fence and Maker, right? Yes. See what they're going to do. See if they'll evaluate and make sure if we fill in the culverts, it's not going to have any impact negative on impacts the, on the land ownership. Yes. And uh, the uh, Lishnear Bridge has been finished. It's repaired. It's opened back up. The uh, no fishing from bridge signs that we go Oh, it was full the day before yesterday. I know. <laughs> I, I didn't realize when the state put the signs back, they didn't put them and they didn't put the ones that um, the, it says that the roads can ice before the bridge. So I have them or, on order to be able to put back. On another thing, we are steady still uh, getting signs in. I never would have dreamed that signs would take that long to come in. So um, there's still a lot in Grand Lake area. I've noticed they don't have a name sign on them or a number sign. 
but they're all, I mean, I just made another big order this week trying to get them up. At some point, we'll need to get uh, a ride through our districts and identify some of the issues that may be there that are being overlooked. So I don't know about the rest of the jury, but at some point, I'd like to ride with somebody from. That's good. I, I, I know uh, me and Shane just did that in uh, Holly Beach, Dawson Bay, and we did. We just about finished Packberry. Because so I do know there's some shoulders that hadn't been repaired that we have to fix, yes, sir. from when the contractors tore them up. And I'm sure everybody has that. And the grass grows them up, and the first thing you know, you ain't about to see them then you, until you hit them with the tractors and tear the blades out of yes, from underneath. Um, and uh, along those lines, I have to say that there are people that watch the video because I've had some phone calls about what happened at the last meeting about discussion, discussions of series cleanup or the lack thereof, and how people have communicated with me and don't let them off the hook kind of thing. My point being that if in each of your districts, uh, if you have complaints, you have people that say, hey, the ditches or something was not cleaned up or was torn up, we, we, in order for us to determine whether there is some legal action or not, that contractually, to, to, to collect money for what it cost us to fix or clean up the problem that should have been done before, whether we have a cause of action or not, we need a database of information so we can evaluate compared to contractual obligations of what they were supposed to do or not do. So in the event, you know, you can start gathering that information, providing it to Emily or Katie or the staff so that they can provide, provide it to us. Because as of right now, it's just we, we're talking this and that but without specifics. I really can't give you a good answer. And again, I know the public watches these things and have asked me about that issue, which, um, you know, so it is something. Well, they history. need to be identified. That, that's my point. And it may be something that the parish needs to, to fix, and it may be something the contractor needs to be responsible for. Well, and, and that's the evaluation process and analyzing that information. And, and I think what, I guess my thought was the public generally probably calls you more than anybody else, you being the feature of your district where there may be a problem. So just make a note, you give that note to the staff so that we can you know, log it in. And we can go take a picture, we can go evaluate each of those identify problems and then evaluate the contract and how they, you know, what they did or didn't do, whether they violated the contract. Right. So that's just wanted to tell you guys to Thank pay you. attention to that. Please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, several meetings back, you guys um, accepted or gave me permission to put out for bid for the demolition. So we need, I'd like your permission to accept those, that bid <coughs> at this meeting. Do you, would you like to know who it was that was awarded the bid? Yes. Uh, Wilkinson's, Wilkinson's, uh, 386,250 for the seven locations. I can do all seven? Yes, sir. Good. Yeah, we're gonna strategically do them uh, depending on which ones need to come down first. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the, we, the ball field and creel needs yes. to come down first before the thing falls on somebody. We're going to do that in the pool because both of them need to come out uh, quickly. Also, you guys gave me permission, gentlemen, I should say, gave me permission to go out for bid for the Grand Lake Library, Grand Chenier Library, and Johnson Bayou Library. We need to accept those bids. We had um, only one bidder on Grand Lake Library, um, Alfred Palma. 185,000 for the repairs. For a branch near, we ended up with four, uh, 589,000. Uh, Kuzans construction. Look like you built a whole building for that. <laughs> I wish. Uh, Johnson <coughs> IE is 452,000, and it's uh, sawgrass construction. And then I have, uh, and the library board on June the 24th accepted those bids, but they just wanted you guys, yeah. all of y'all's blessing. Uh, I do have a question on that, uh, yes, sir. Wendy. Is these Kuzans and Sauls or whatever, have we checked to see what kind of people they are? They've all been vetted by the architect firm. They did the bidding process for us, 
and also check their credentials, all their it, everything that. So they've been in business for a while, or did they just start six <clears throat> months? Yes, sir. Ago? I mean, I can get the exact dates for you, but they were all checked out okay. and cleared by the architect. I just want to make before. sure they what some fly by nights. Mm -hmm. What yes, a name. Sir. No, I agree. <clears throat> Um, I asked them to give us a, a broader range. They they were doing the bidding um, electronically, so you could, if you were in different areas, you could bid. Because I, I wanted us to get competitive bids as well. Mm -hmm. So whenever they turned in their bids, they had to turn in all the proper documentation. You know how long they've been in business, who they, their insurance information, all their bonding, you know that kind of thing. So they've been vetted through our architect people that we hired um, and then I need permission to uh, go out for bid for Myriad fire station Cameron rec district number six which the rec will their board will vote on this as well but they asked for y'all's blessing and the multi-purpose building right back here and the big lake pier um, next month I have all the fire stations except for Grand Lake and the Fireman Center that's going to take a little bit longer to do a few things and then Creole but <clears throat> Myriad is ready to go the bidding and um, Cameron Rec is too it's been gutted it's ready to go and the multi-purpose building there's some minor details on that so and then the pier what we had the some structural damage Rick? sir what about the Grand Chenier Recreation Center Grand Chenier Recreation Center, Kristen and them are handling most of that on their own. She I offered help, but they had um, a lot of volunteers that came in and gutted the building and took care of that. And they had several contractors. I helped, you know, with a few things here and there, but most of their board decided to do that on their own. I think they kind of felt like they would get get it done faster, but I'm not sure that that yeah. all came to fruition. Okay. So. How about the uh, Paris Barn? Paris Barn, we're working on Cameron, Cameron Creole Barn right now. They're working on the RV hookups. Uh, we've met with Mosquito Control and with Miss Emily on the office building. Most of that's just retinning and getting some things done. So, I mean, that's all in the works. <clears throat> the fire stations were a really big priority for us because we didn't want the residents to have any rate increase you know, for their um, right. firemen, yeah, for the insurance. So that was a big deal for me. I, I wanted to make sure we got those going first. Um, it, it, some of these just fall in line, like there, it didn't appear that there was a lot of damage for for the libraries, but you know, I mean, we had some some things that were found that we didn't see in the beginning. <clears throat> so we're- I don't mind falling in line, but I want it all to be taken care of. Uh, we are working diligently to get it all taken care of. Because it's falling in line, uh, putting somebody behind. No, sir. I, I, we're putting, we're not, there's no priority list other than the fire stations, but every bit of it is in the works. With the, our architects are working on every bit of this, engineers and architects. I get new drawings. Um, there's a few things on the stuff that's coming that I'd like to put out, these four that I'd like to put out for bid. Uh, Randy is going to go over those. Um, all the documentation for that. I have all those printed and on his desk and we're going to go through that before they actually run them in the paper. We'll do that this week in the first part of next. Sounds good. Okay. Thank y'all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Anything else, Ms. Um, The only other thing you might not have uh, been briefed on yet was uh, agenda item 21 which was um, we're going to ask for president authority to sign a letter to congress and to the president this is going to be a letter different than what we've been sending just specifically from the jury this is going to be a partnership with all of the southwest louisiana businesses um, police jury offices the city offices and it's going to be one letter from all of us as one unit that's going to go to Congress and to the President requesting, again, for the hundredth time, a supplemental disaster fund allocation. He's not getting his mail. No. They stopped him before. <clears throat> They're telling him what he can and can't do. Almost yeah. a year later. He's We've still been not doing everything mail. independently, and so now, since that's been unsuccessful, they want everyone in our region to send a letter together. You need to send it to Pelosi. Tell them to put it on a postcard. 
<laughs> That's what he gets is out of his pocket. Oh, it's just cheaters. <laughs> and a postcard. Danny, I guess so. Danny, the, the Gulf looks okay. <laughs> For the next ten days. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have anything else? Uh, I do have one thing. Uh, Robert Bruce retired. Yes, sir. He retired. Yes, we sir. need to we need to hire somebody to take his place. And also, we need to consider being Stephen Broussard still on work comp. We need to replace him. We need to put a working man in his shoes because he's not working. Yeah. Has he said anybody ever talked people. to him? And <clears throat> um, him? He's the last. Okay, so. No, there's a copy. He has a. He has conditions that he had that we have to be able to provide a position that um, accommodates his limitations. Um, he could never, with his limitations, go back to working on the road crew. The only thing he would be suitable for would be maybe a desk job. How about a spray truck? No, the mm -hmm. job. Is Not with his limitations. A desk job's about the only thing that we would be able to accommodate. He him. can't. He can't sit at the trash dumps and not do nothing but sign people in and out. Oh, he could do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if there's something we need to do heavy, the, get somebody over there. One of the um, positions that we were considering offering him that we feel like we could successfully accommodate his limitations would be to put him at court at the courthouse as part of the courthouse security. Um, has an elevator, so he can get to his desk safely in and out of the elevator. It's not required to to, to climb any stairs. People might have to hire somebody for that anyway. And so. we, right now we have two deputies providing courthouse security. Um, we could maybe relieve one of the deputies and place him there with the deputy. That would be an option. Right. You, you do it you instead of paying the salary if somebody's not there. I mean, he's, well, he's on workman's comp. Yeah. yeah we still I mean, we can offer him that right? position uh, to do, yep. like I said, courthouse security where he sits at a desk and he um, signs people in and out of the courthouse. That's about the only job we have available for him. That's does that does we offer. do we have anybody that communicates with Workman's Call? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Kayla, Kayla and Braids. Okay. Or any point of contacts. That's a good idea, Kurt. Make but sure. Kurt makes a valid point. If he's not coming back, then, you know, we need a live body. Now, we did make arrangements for someone on staff. We have facility maintenance. Um, that was kind of filling in and learning how to take care of all the facilities around here, do gra uh, grass cutting and weeding and stuff. We uh, made the decision yesterday to have him report to Grand Lake every day until he's called the report here to do work. So we have someone I want to hire somebody in that position. I don't want to have to switch around. I want to hire somebody So you want to position. lift the hiring freeze? Yes. We, mm -hmm. we, can, we can add it on and lift it this evening, hire two people, and then it's froze after that. Replace these people, these two guys on the road crew. I don't want to have to send somebody around, borrow somebody from somebody else. And also send that one that ain't doing nothing up there, too. He's going Tuesday. Yeah, he's, huh? he's going Tuesday. He's, he's still going to be responsible for maintaining this area, but right now we're prioritizing road cutting and ditch digging over, keeping the grass cut here. So I agree. I agree with Kurt. I'm in favor of adding a uh, Positions, lifting the hiring freeze, putting it back in place, just give it authority to hire two people to replace those employees that's not there. Well, um, we'll take it under advisement. We could get authority to hire. We'll take a look at it and see. We have to put it as an add on. I don't have a problem with any of y'all. Authority to advertise two road and bridge employees? Yes. Do you have to you would replace time? one that was going to be retiring, so your cost isn't going to be different, but the other employee would be adding a cost that you didn't already have to your budget, a full-time position. So it would be creating a new full-time position. That's all right. We need it. What are you talking about? But if Robert you put a guy Broussard. at the courthouse, you still got to replace him because you're paying two of them instead of one. Yeah, because he'll still get paid when he comes to the courthouse. So you have to have he ain't coming to no courthouse. <laughs> you don't forget about that. Yeah, about, how about they turn it? <laughs> how about yeah, they turn it? How about if you have a job? Oh, yeah, so why they turn it down? What happens then? If they, if if they turn it down, then um, see you're done. They, they're done. If you have a suitable job for somebody, yes. they turn it yep. down. You're done. 
Yes. Well, we got to provide that for them. You got a suitable job? We can, if you guys are, are ready, we can make the work with workers' comp and make the offer to them for that position. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Got anything, anything else? else? <laughs> well, 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 well,